Want a little secret about Canada that no one's really talking about outside of Canada? And, like, I know that some people in America are aware of this, right? But anyone talks about Canada. They go, oh, healthcare is free, blah, blah, blah. And I do know that some people are aware, like, well, you do have to wait longer, you know? Ooh, understatement of the century, okay? Um, in Canada, you'll probably die first before you get the help you need. Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Base Politics. Welcome back to Hannah Explains It All, where every week I'm helping you understand public policy decisions and how they're impacting your life. This week, we're going to talk about Canada's healthcare system. If you like this series, be sure to catch up on old episodes after this. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment and a like. I certainly don't need to be the one to tell you that there is a huge push in the United States for us to have a single payer or universal type healthcare system. This would basically mean that the government would have complete control over the healthcare sector and you wouldn't have to pay for it, except you would because you pay taxes and obviously this thing has to get funded in one way or another. In these kinds of discussions, I frequently hear people point to Canada or England or other countries that have similar systems to this. They say, it's so great living in these countries. Nobody has any medical debt. It's so easy to get care. You just walk into a facility and boom, there you go. And they're constantly dogging the United States healthcare system, saying that it's too expensive, that it's not quality care. And listen, I have plenty of criticisms of the U.S. healthcare system. In fact, I did a complete episode of the original series of Based on that topic, which you can go back and watch. It's a lift. But this picture that they are trying to paint in order to lobby for universal health care here in the United States by comparing it to these other countries and saying this is a utopia, it's so much better over there, completely falls apart the minute you do any research into what's actually happening in those countries. Virtually all of them are going bust as we speak. I mean, they are blowing up. But today I want to focus on Canada because it's closest to the United States geographically and because I feel like it's the system that gets pointed to the most here. I'm going to give you some numbers to back all this up in a minute, but you don't even have to go data digging to really understand what's happening in Canada because the Canadians are trying to tell you themselves. There are doctors that know that if they're handing out certain diagnoses, totally treatable, totally treatable if you do it in time but they know they're not gonna be able to see a specialist in that time. So they just know these people are going to die because they cannot get help. I have been dealing with literally pain in my liver. I can't see a doctor. Can't see a doctor, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what's going on. There just literally aren't enough physicians. It's not that they're picking and choosing and picking poorly. They literally just don't have physicians. There's nobody here. There's nobody here. So you want to come here? You want to be like, oh, I just, I, I, I want to get free healthcare. You'll probably die first. Okay. I've been on a wait list for a general practitioner, a GP for six months. And you can't do anything here without a GP. I can't go get a, I can't even go to the gynecologist for, just for a routine exam. And I had precancerous tissue in my cervix. So I have to get checked twice a year. Can't even do that. So here I am. I have gone to two walk-in clinics in the past week to try to get help, they're full. I call as soon as they open because they say, hey, don't come visit us, call us. We only start answering phones at 8.30. Call us, we'll give you an appointment that day. I called as soon as 8.29, 8.30, called them. As soon as I got they were like, oh, we're full, full. You know how bad that is where I'm considering moving back to the States? Because I'm like, look, if the only thing getting in my way of healthcare is actually just paying someone, I will take medical debt now. I will, because at least I will live. The reality is the government and members of the media who often operate like puppets for them have every incentive to try to convince people that what they're doing is working. So if you just go to the mainstream media outlets in Canada, they're not always going to tell you the full picture. Now, even they are having to admit that it is like mayday, mayday, the sky is falling. But their solutions are always just throw more money at it, that will fix it. And nothing could be further from the truth. Canada already spent billions of dollars on its healthcare system. They just pledged another 200 billion and it's still not going to be enough. And this girl is far from the only person talking about this on TikTok. With a very quick scroll through TikTok, I found multiple people who are not only discussing their issues that they're having just in getting health care, basic health care, primary health care in Canada, they're actually talking about moving to the United States for our health care. When I tell people I live in Canada, they go, oh, you live in Canada? So you have free health care. Yeah, yeah, we do. But there's a reason it's free. You either have to wait a decade to get an appointment to see a doctor, or when you actually see a doctor, I'm convinced some of them literally have just walked off the street. 
Universal healthcare is great until it's not. Once again, this is Burna v. Vancouver specific, but we cannot find a pediatrician, we can't find a family doctor. Waitlist to see specialists are absolutely bizarre. Six months to see an allergist. If you missed it two months ago, I had the worst allergic reaction. I literally was on my deathbed. My throat closing off, my lip was massive. Like, I can't see an allergist for six months. My daughter had seizures when she was six months old, and when we moved to Canada, we were supposed to book like a follow up EEG every single year. It's taken a year and a half just to get her an EEG. Whereas in the States when she was six months old and going through it, I was able to call my pediatrician on his cell phone and say, I need you to book me an EEG. Sure, we had the scary ER visit and she got an EEG in the hospital same day, but like when her seizure stopped, I called my pediatrician and I was like, I just need to confirm that like her brain pattern, brain waves are all normal. And he booked it for me the next day, a 24 hour at home EEG. Part of the reason we're in Vancouver right now is because Izzy's mom needs a total double knee surgery and she was on the wait list for over a year before she even got her first one. This woman can't work because her knees are so bad. She doesn't qualify for disability, so she's stuck at home. As I mentioned, universal, aka government healthcare, is not really going well anywhere. Almost all of these systems are going broke, have crazy long waits, it's very difficult to get a bed, and basically have patients dying on the floor because of it. The United States definitely has our own issues in our healthcare system, which are mostly due to the government, and I'll get to some of that in a minute. But what we don't have are situations where people cannot get basic care. I'm talking about not being able to be seen at an ER. I'm talking about not being able to get your kids into a primary care doctor. I'm talking about not being able to get basic surgeries like knee replacements for well over a year. But when it comes to these government healthcare systems that are falling apart, it really does seem like Canada's is one of the worst. According to data from the Commonwealth Fund, in 2020, Canada ranked dead last 10 out of 10 among universal healthcare countries for both specialist appointment waits and receipt of elective surgery. Another report I had detailing how difficult it was for people just to access medical care said that 58% had problems getting into a specialist, 54% had problems getting emergency care, 51% could not get surgical procedures when they needed them, and 44% were having difficulty getting non-emergency treatments. Another 41% couldn't get diagnostic tests that they need. This is life or death, especially things like diagnostic testing. It might sound small, but if you have a lump in your breast and you can't get in to see a specialist or have it tested for months and months and months, that could be the difference in you being able to get treatment and live or dying. I also found this article in the National Observer, which is a big outlet in Canada. It's by your typical left-wing progressive who supports government health care. And in it, of course, he is just pushing for the system to be given more money. But I want to read you some of the anecdotes that he admits in this article. He says, if you spent even a moment trying to access critical care over the last few years, you know just how bad things have gotten. Wait times at emergency rooms often stretch into days rather than hours. Surgeries and other necessary procedures are being delayed, and finding a family doctor just keeps getting more difficult. Doctors and nurses, many of whom are suffering from pandemic-related burnout and some low-grade PTSD, are retiring early. As a result, a system that's supposed to provide universal coverage is becoming decidedly less equitable. As Dr. Tara Kira notes in a new study published in the CMAJ, what we have is a haves and have not situation. There are people who do have access to a family doctor and a health team, and then those who have nothing. And I just think that is so ironic because that is the same talking point that progressives try to use in the United States to push for us to have universal health care, right? They try to say that only the wealthy can get care and that we have a system where if you don't have money, you can be burdened with tons of medical debt. And again, there are problems in our system that need to be addressed. But the difference is in our system, when somebody's wealthy or somebody doesn't have money, they can still access care no matter what. How cost prohibitive that is for them, the burden it places on them, that's worth a discussion. But they do get treatment. They do still live. He goes on to say that according to a recent survey of family doctors in the province of Alberta, 91% are concerned about the financial viability of their practice, with 61% considering leaving the province as a result. This is happening at a time when a record number of people are looking for a family doctor or trying to avoid losing one they already have. This is just so interesting to me, too, because these are not small rural areas that they're talking about. Alberta is a pretty big area. The other woman in the video said she lived in Vancouver and couldn't get a primary care doctor for her kid. That is crazy. He also knows that Edmonton's pediatric hospital was so short-staffed recently and so overwhelmed with patients that it canceled and delayed surgeries for sick and injured kids. As a pair of doctors noted in a December 25th letter to the provincial government, several children each week are having their treatment or surgery canceled with no guarantee of urgent rescheduling. 
After the events of last week, we can tell you that we are failing daily and children are suffering and may die as a result. Like, this is very dire. Canadians should be outraged and Americans should be taking note of what is happening. Given these issues that are going on in Canada's system, the people who can afford to leave and get treatment often are. Many of them are coming to the United States to get health care, ironically enough. I found this chart and it shows the main things that people are leaving to get care for outside of Canada. And as you can see, you have things like neurosurgery, plastic surgery, which tracks because plastic surgery is a lot cheaper here, urology, medical oncology, oncology, like people can't get cancer treatment there, gynecology, general surgeries, internal medicine, orthopedic surgery, radiation, cardiovascular surgery. These are critical care items that people are having to travel abroad for just to access. That is not a first world problem. I've had a lot of people from Canada actually reach out to me about getting a joint replacement. They say surgeries are delayed a year, they can't get their surgery for another two or three years. And this is the downside of universal health care is that not as many procedures are performed, so access is limited. I had trouble really nailing down just how many Canadians are leaving to get surgery because once again, the media and their government are not super forthcoming with that information. But according to a policy brief titled Flight of the Sick, which is by a Calgary-based think tank called Second Street, they predict about 217,500 Canadians left the country for healthcare in 2017. Now their system has gotten substantially worse in the past couple of years, especially since COVID. So I'm guessing those numbers are a lot higher. For the record, medical tourism is a booming industry globally and the United States gets a pretty hefty chunk of that pie. In 2022 alone, it was a $4.98 billion market. That's a lot of people coming here to get healthcare from their countries. And that's because as a whole, the American healthcare system is far better than the vast majority of other countries. Countries. The reason that our system has become so expensive and why we ourselves are starting to see some shortage issues are because of government involvement and regulation in the market. The healthcare sector in the United States is actually probably one of the least capitalistic that we have. And by that, I mean it is absolutely overrun with government regulation. Because of that, we ourselves are in danger of seeing our own industry start to stagnate and the prices spike. The solution to this would, of course, be to get government out of the way and go the opposite direction of where people who support universal health care want us to go. Instead, they look at the problems in the U.S. healthcare market that are created by government intervention and regulation of the industry and say, hmm, I guess we should give the government total control of the market in order to fix this problem. It makes sense if you like don't think about it absolutely at all, I guess. And in fact, if you look at sectors of the American healthcare system where the government has not been involved, you can see the difference. Take plastic surgery, for example. Plastic surgery is elective. That means that insurance companies don't cover it. The insurance companies are one of the biggest problems in the healthcare sector in America because they are the vehicle that the government uses to basically control the industry. When insurance gets involved, it stops being a basic supply and demand equation. You'll notice that's why you often aren't given prices for things. There's a lot of strings being pulled behind the scenes. And that allows the providers and the insurance companies to charge you a lot more for a product or a service than what it's actually worth. But when you remove the insurance factor and therefore the government factor from a sector of healthcare, you get back to an actual market. And so for things like plastic surgery, we've seen the prices drastically decrease in recent years. The same is true for things like LASIK eye surgery, where once again, when insurance didn't cover it and the government wasn't involved in it, it allowed for innovation to speed up, people paid basic cash for the service, and over time, it actually decreased in price. That same thing could happen in many other sectors of our healthcare system if we got the government and the insurance companies out of them. That's why I support things like direct primary care, which basically allows doctors to opt out of taking insurance. Of course, the insurance companies often try to fight this and you have to watch out at the state level because they'll try to regulate it and prevent doctors from being able to operate it. But when you do see this model, doctors typically will charge people a monthly rate kind of like a gym membership. And for that, you'll get unlimited visits with them. They typically will be able to give you video calls or text messages, check in with you on various things. They'll negotiate cash payments for services like CAT scans or diagnostic testing. Basically, you get back to having an actual relationship with your doctor. You know what it's going to cost. And it actually saves the doctor's money. The ones that I've worked with are able to spend more time with their patients because they're not having to deal with all of the red tape and bureaucracy that comes along with insurance and the government. 
And because they have so much time freed up, they're then able to see more patients, meaning they make more money, you pay a lower price. And that's exactly the kind of system we need if we want to incentivize people to go into the healthcare sector as providers. There's also laws like certificate of need laws across the states that were put in place in the 1970s intentionally to keep prices artificially high for certain industry insiders. Essentially, what they do is protect the large hospital associations in each state and say that you cannot come in and compete with them. You can't build a new hospital. You can't add new beds. You can't even add new MRI type equipment, anything like that, without going before government board and proving that there is a need for it in the community. And then the large hospital associations that obviously donate a ton of money to the politicians who are staffing this board, they come in and get to lobby against you and say why you don't have a need. And guess who usually wins? The large hospital association. That's why in most states, there's one or two companies that dominate the healthcare sector. There's not competition. They can keep prices artificially high. And we don't have the kind of innovation that we should be seeing in our healthcare sector. I could go on and on and on about the ways the U.S. government has gotten involved in the healthcare market and ruined it. Again, I encourage you to go watch my original video on the subject because it's dense and there's a lot of ground to cover. But all in all, what you should know is that when the free market is allowed to work in the healthcare sector, things get better. Costs come down, there's more innovation, there's more discovery, doctors are happier, they get to actually spend their time practicing medicine and with patients versus filling out paperwork. And all in all, we should all be looking for ways that we can get the government out of this market so that it can continue to improve. What we shouldn't be doing, though, is going in the opposite direction and giving the government total control of the healthcare market like we see in Canada. What's happening in Canada is a basic supply and demand problem, and it's why all of these systems ultimately fall apart. They're economically illiterate. Essentially, the problem boils down to the fact that they don't have enough doctors or facilities or providers. In an actual free market system, when you have a demand, people need health care, there's a lot of people, supply would obviously rise to meet it. So when it doesn't happen, you have to wonder why. And that's because when a government starts controlling an industry, it's therefore no longer a free market capitalist system. It lacks basic profit motivations. It lacks basic price signals. All of the things that are quietly happening naturally in a free market that incentivize people to rise to meet demand go away. First and foremost, the government simply does not pay providers what they're worth. Becoming a doctor or a nurse or really any kind of healthcare provider is a substantial lift. You have to be extremely smart. You have to go through a ton of schooling. You usually have to take on a good bit of debt in order to obtain that schooling. You have to work as a resident and then a fellow, meaning you're not making your full salary for a number of years just to get up and going. So why would you do all of that if at the end of the day you get to the finish line and you still are not paid very well for all of that work and labor and effort? And on top of that, you don't even get to spend the bulk of your time actually practicing medicine or spending time with your patient. And instead, you're having to deal with the government and bureaucrats all day? No thanks. This is why they don't have enough people entering the medical field and they also have a lot of people retiring early. Thus, you have a shortage. The government is also really, really bad at allocating resources. When you have the government trying to centrally control the market, they have to basically guess at how those resources should be allocated. And because there's scarcity, there's only so much of it to go around. That is an undeniable fact that socialists and progressives so often want to ignore, but ignoring it does not make it go away. Scarcity is a reality. There's only so much of a product or service to go around. So how it's allocated is really important. When the government's trying to centrally plan things and allocate scarce resources, it basically has to guess at where they should go. And then you can use some data to try to estimate that this area has this many people, so they need this many hospitals or this many doctors. But people are constantly moving, population is constantly changing, and so those models will become outdated quite quickly. Instead, in a free market system, supply rises to meet demand. So as an area grows or shrinks, doctors and providers would naturally come and go from there. Or if the population grows and people can make more money being providers, you then have an incentive for more people to go to medical school and enter the field. But when the government's running that system, none of those basic incentives exist. Price is really just a signal of scarcity. This is a basic economic 101 concept. Price can, of course, be skewed by government factors and regulations, but that's really a false price. So in our system, for example, because you have the insurance companies acting as a middleman, they're able to charge you a lot more for basic services than what most people could afford. You're not in a true free market system. 
because since most people can't afford it, they wouldn't be buying it. And therefore, the providers would not be able to sell their product. They'd have to reduce the price in order to meet the market where it's at. Insurance and government come in and totally skew that picture. And that's what government often does. It gets in the way of basic price signals. Price signals to providers, hey, there's a need here. You can make money selling this. You should produce more. When the price signal is interrupted, though, those signals get lost in translation. And again, you won't see demand rising to meet supply as it should. There's a lot of people who continue to complain about corporate greed or profit motivations and capitalism, and that is asinine. There's nothing wrong with wanting to make money. It is that drive that incentivizes people to go through all this labor to become providers and give you something you desperately need to stay alive. And it turns out when you remove that profit incentive, most people aren't going to do all of that labor just out of the goodness of their hearts. Thus, you have what's happening in Canada where everybody has free health care that is basically unusable. And it's gotten so bad as their population is aging that they have literally started opting to let people kill themselves in Canada. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Socialism is deadly. It leaves absolutely every country and every sector that it touches impoverished and ultimately it gets people killed. Fortunately, it seems that a slight majority of Americans have not completely lost their marbles and are still opposed to the government running our healthcare system. But I'm hardly comfortable with these percentages. Overall, 57% of Americans say government should ensure health coverage for all in the US. Fortunately, 53% still favor a healthcare system that's based on private insurance, but 43% do support a government one. Notably of those, 72% are Democrats. <laughs> and 13% of Republicans. That would be absolutely ruinous. It's inexcusable in the age of information to not be aware of what's actually happening in universal health care systems. And with that information, you have a job as an American citizen to be active and ensure that we don't follow that same path. There are a ton of ways you can actually get involved on this issue. Many of these regulations on the health care sector are being set at the state level. That means you need to get in touch with your state senators and state representatives to let them know your thoughts. Some things you might want to ask them about is where is our state on certificate of need laws? What are you doing to get rid of them if we have them? What are you doing to ensure that telehealth access continues to expand? Are you doing things to protect direct primary care and giving doctors more options? Or what is our state doing to reduce occupational licensing hazards that make it hard for nurses or doctors to come here and work from other states? All right, guys, that's a wrap for this week. Leave me a comment. Let me know if you were surprised at just how bad Canada's healthcare system actually is. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give me a like, and I'll see you next week. If you like this video, be sure to check out others in my series, Hannah Explains It All, here. And you can tune in to my weekly show, The Base Politics Podcast with Brad Palumbo, here.